Good morning. Welcome to Faith. Go ahead and get started here. Our Deacon of the Month went to um, Illinois, and I told him he could fly in and take care of announcements and then go back, and he said, no, he wasn't going to do it. So he asked me to fill in for him. Um, Mission of the Month, helping in his name, Food Pantry. Um, of course, no Bible studies or anything this week coming. Yes, if you want to bring something, please do, okay? We generally don't take it off until the Sunday following. So, um, is that right, Melissa? Okay, Linda, excuse me. Um, anyway, so if you uh, feel need to do so, list of needs is in here on the, uh, the bulletins. Um, congregational call meeting, second Sunday in January, January the 9th. Um, we're going to have the uh, John Cleveland, our uh, selected candidate, will be speaking to us, preaching, uh, and then there'll be a congregational meeting after that with regards to the terms of his call. So uh, put that in your calendars. Make sure that you're here. You must be present in order to participate in that and vote, okay? Uh, Mr. Hawkins decided that he would have a sinus infection today. Uh, and it's taken his voice. So he is not going to be with us, so we're going to do a um, little abbreviated compilation here of the elders and get the message out, uh, just not quite in the same manner. So be patient with us. Let's see. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, no children's church. <coughs> we're not going to do children's church because we will be a little bit abbreviated, so you're going to have to suffer through with your own children with you this time. But, anywho, other than that, I guess we're good to go. I don't know that we're good to go because I told Mark, I said, I got so many thoughts running around in my head, this is going to be just jumbled. But, good morning, Merry Christmas. I wasn't able to be here at the Christmas Eve service, but Merry Christmas to everybody. I hope it was good for everybody. So, now what? The other day, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about uh, some different things about, uh, I, I know one time I referenced a, a thing I'd heard on the radio about a little girl that uh, she had to give away her little dolls and stuff to a, a family that had lost a lot of things in, in a, a fire or a because their family was sick or something like that. and I, So I thought about some of these things, and, and I actually did something similar uh, several times this year that, that I have been given a gift. And I thought about this, and um, seems like when it, it sort of changes. You know, when you're, when you're a little kid, you really know how to get a gift because it's like, yeah, you know, and, but you don't really like to give a gift necessarily when you're a little kid. Uh, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, I wanna, I'd rather have, you know, something for myself. Well, that, that kind of changes, I think, as we get older, and it becomes easier to give a gift and less easy, I guess, to accept a gift. Um, just some different things. Uh, a buddy of mine just this past week, and all of you know him, I won't mention any names, I won't mention what the gift is, but uh, he gifted me something, and I was like, no, I'm not going to let you do that. It's, that's too much money. I'm not going to let you do that. I, but he had bought something that he wanted to, to give to me, and uh, anyway, we argued back and forth about it. Well, uh, he won, and uh, several months back, uh, a friend of mine, uh, his dad passed away this uh, year or so ago, and, and he and I were really good friends, and, and me and his son, are, he's one of my very best friends, and uh, he came up, he came down to the house, and uh, 
when he got out, we, we've hunted together all of our lives. Um, when he was just born, I remember being at his first birthday party. I'm, I'm a good bit older than he is, but and his dad was a good bit older than me, but we all meshed together, and, and we hunted together for 25 years. And uh, he got out of the truck, and he held up this Browning deer rifle. And as he walked toward me, I said, Oh, cool, you, you got, uh, you've cleaned it up. It's, I said, is that, uh, is that Big Al's Browning? And he looked at me with tears in his eyes, as I did, and uh, he said, no, it's not. He said, it's, it's your Browning. And I kind of looked at him, and he said, he would have wanted you to have it, and I certainly want you to have it. And so he gave me that that gun and I I was just in awe by that you know and I was like no I, I cannot take that and he said you you're absolutely going to so um, in saying that you know sometimes it's it's hard when and I you know you've given gifts before like that when somebody has said I'm not gonna take that it's too much too much but I, I think what we need to what I'm getting at here is how to accept a gift um, and I think it should always be with gratitude. And so I looked up gratitude, and it's the quality of being thankful and the readiness to show appreciation for and return kindness. You know, a, a guy one time, I was, I was right up here at the Kroger when we lived up here, and I, was, I had pulled in to get gas, and as you know around here, it's gotten pretty congested over the years and so I pulled in to get gas and as I did a, a younger kid sort of just whipped right in there and and he stopped like that and he was like oh sorry I said no go ahead you know I was somewhat aggravated well he got up there to the pump he walked over there to pay he didn't do the quick pay thing he walked over there to pay at the little center thing there at uh, Kroger and when he came back out he said hey by the way he said I've, I've paid for your gas and I said, do what? And he said, well, however much you get, $25 of it's already been paid for. He said, I appreciate you letting me go in front of you. <laughs> and I thought, well, you ding dong, there you are being, you know, <laughs> ugly about it, and he's paid for your gas. And so I've tried to do something similar over the years. Every now and then I'll go through a drive through or something, and I'll say, hey, the guy, you know, the guy behind me, what did they get? Okay, here, just put that, you know, I'll pay for both of them. Um, and not that, not that I do it right all the time, but it's just something that, that that kid sort of inspired me to do. So, what do you do with the gift? And, you know, I... And when I'm saying the, the gift, I mean the one we received on Christmas. Absolutely, you treat that with gratitude. And you try to uh, do as he did. But a lot of times I know people think, uh, you know, that they're not worthy of that or, or whatever it may be. Well, in... Uh, before I go there, gifts, does it matter how big or small it is? And no, it does not. In Mark 12, 41, he talks about the widow's gift as she um, gives everything she had. It was not much and not nearly what some of the others had given out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty but mostly I think what she gave from was out of her heart. And she gave that knowing that it would cost her, uh, but that it would gain the kingdom. And so, no, it doesn't matter how big the gift may be, the physical gift, I, I guess, but it's how much from the heart that it comes from. But then when you talk about the gift of Christ, 
Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, I think when you say gratitude for something, it's the way you, you think of that is not, well, no, that's too much, no, that's too much. What, it's what was that person that's giving the gift thinking. It's not up to you to decide whether you're worthy or whether someone else of your peers thinks that you're worthy. It's the person giving you the gift that decides whether or not you're worthy to have that gift. And because it's out of their heart that they're thinking of you. And certainly it was out of God's heart, him thinking of us, when he sent his son knowing that he would die. And that, I mean, there's no price that can be put on that. I know a lot of people think, uh, you know, because of their sin or whatever has gone on, and I certainly have thought the same thing many times myself, that you're just not, you're not worthy of the gift. Uh, and again, it's not for you to decide whether you're worthy or not. God knows everything about you. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you're going to do. And if he deems you worthy of it, you're worthy of it. So what do you do with that? Just like trying to return the gift of the guy giving me the gas. So I, in turn, have thought of that from time to time and think, I could do something similar to that for someone else. Well, in Mark 12, 39 is where Christ is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And of course, it's to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is to love your neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. And so I think that is returning that gift. Is you're supposed to love like Christ loved us, and that's the way that we're to love our family and love our neighbor. And whenever you may think that you're not worthy, you know, in Malachi 3, 17, God refers to us as his treasured possession or in some, in some uh, different Bibles, uh, that's not the ESV, it's re you're referred to as his jewels when he gathers his jewels. So you were purchased and uh, for you to think that you're not worthy would be to say that God made a mistake in purchasing you. And he does not make bad investments. He always makes the correct investment. And so if he has sent his son to die for you and me, and he has purchased you with that price, he thought it was a good investment. And it is because he doesn't make mistakes. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for the blessing of this day, for the people that are here. We ask your care on those that are uh, not with us, that may be traveling, that are sick. Be with them and comfort them and, and uh, heal them, get, us, get them back soon. As we go through the service today, help us to <coughs> sing and say the words that you would have us to deliver. We do thank you so much for this church. We thank you most of all for the birth of your son and his teachings and what it means for us. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our invitation to worship is from uh, Psalms 95, 1 through 3. If you would stand, please. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all kings. Song of praise, hymn number 224, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, Joy to the World. 
we started our Advent season um, the Sunday after Thanksgiving singing this song, and we're going to end it today with this song. The Lord is with us. Uh, his blessings go as far as the curse is found, and we have all that to look forward to in this new year. So we don't have a lot of people, but let's sing it joyfully, all right? Here we go. Joy to
Amen. Now, if you will please stand. Together we'll affirm God's gracious mercy, our freedom to draw near with joy and confidence in Christ. From Revelation 5, 9. For you were slain by your blood. You were ransomed to people of God. For every tribe, language, people, and nation. Now we will sing hymn number 228. One, two, three, four, and five. We three kings. Please be seated. Now we'll worship God through our giving as we take the collection. The hymn today is 234 verses 1, 2, and 3. Some of you may not know this song. We did sing it one time last year. It's a great Christmas song to lead us into the new year. All is well, because we belong to the Lord.
Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for that gift. You, the, thank you, give the gift of abundant eternal life. You have said that you are a good Father who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from abundant blessing you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Your turn. Oh, wait a minute. Kids message? She didn't write anyone in here. Children want to come up front for a quick children's message. <laughs> Good morning. We have a light crowd here today. Okay. How about this? Is that better? <laughs> okay. Now. When I was nine years old, many, many, many years ago, half a century ago, Christmas Eve is when our family always did our gift exchange, okay? And we lived in a house in Morrow, which is a little town way up in here. And we had our Christmas down in the basement. And we heard a knock on the back door. I didn't know what was going on, okay? And when the door opened, my father came in, and he was pushing a mini bike. okay? Now, I was a young man, and I enjoyed mini bikes, and I had ridden several, but I had never had one on my own. And so that's what I got for Christmas that year, okay? And when I asked this question, I can do this securely because I know Elliot's not here, okay? <laughs> so what was your favorite Christmas gift? Can you tell me that? No, nothing in particular? How about you? What was your favorite Christmas gift? Legos. Legos? Okay. All right. Well, that mini bike was mine, and I remember it to this day. 
that that was the best gift that I had ever gotten. But in no way does it compare to the gift that God gave us, okay? Do you know the gift that God gave us on Christmas? Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the present that he gave us on Christmas. He was born on Christmas, okay? Hey, Kaylee, born on Christmas. That's the best gift that anyone could ever give to us because it provided to us eternal life. Okay, so every time you think about Christmas and you think about all these wonderful things that you've gotten, never forget what God gave to you, and that was Jesus Christ, okay? And let's say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the best gift ever given, your Son, Jesus, who gave us eternal life, salvation for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may go. No children's church today, though. We're adding a few things and changing a few things. We'd like for you to sing with us right now a song we don't sing that often. What a friend we have in Jesus. It's number 164. be seated. So if I mispronounce some words going through this, I haven't read over it because I just found out I was reading this <laughs> just a little bit ago. So before I read Hebrews uh, 11, 1039, it says, But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. My little notes here in the bottom of my page on my Bible, it's a ESV study Bible. It says, By defining faith, 
the Greek pistos as assurance and conviction, the author indicates that biblical faith is not a vague hope grounded in imaginary wishful thinking. Instead, faith is a settled confidence that something in the future, something that is not yet seen but has been promised by God, will actually come to pass because God will bring it about. So if you would, well, I'll tell you what, since it's the whole chapter, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but do in your heart have reverence for God's holy word. So starting uh, verse 1 in chapter 11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the words of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable, acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which, was commended, uh, which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his, gift, his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning, uh, concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he was condemned, uh, by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had, <clears throat> who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons, each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus 
of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he, in, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That is the word, reading of God's word. In Hebrews 11, faith is mentioned 19 times, if I counted right, which I'm not sure. <laughs> but a um, little note in my Bible, even under the old covenant, faith was an essential for relationship with God. He did it with Abraham, Moses, Noah. The Old Testament saints believed God and obeyed him even though they did not see his promises fulfilled completely. We have the advantage because we have the New Testament and we have seen God's promise completely fulfilled that we can have faith in Christ. This is a devotional written by a man named John D. Payne. The Christian way is to remain faithful at all cost. Since Sincere believers do not make deals with the world. We are called and empowered to live by conviction, not compromise, even amid, amid fierce competition. No one knew this better than Margaret Wilson and Margaret McLean, two godly women who were unashamed of the gospel and loved Christ more than earthly comforts indeed, even more than life itself. And when I read the names, I'm thinking, well, this is going to talk about somebody really recent. In the spring of 1685, during the time of severe persecution, the two Margarets stood trial as prisoners of Wigan, a small burg in the southwest corner of Scotland. Christians have been put under the gun many, many, many times. One of the reasons we read Hebrews 
is that was one of the purposes of the letter to Hebrews is they were coming under the thumb of the Roman Empire. They were unjustly sentenced to death by drowning. What were their crimes? First, they refused to publicly submit themselves to King James II and his unwarranted ecclesiastical authority. Second, they rejected the state's church's false worship. And third, they attended conventional illegal worship services that met in private homes and open fields. In a word, these two women, one elderly, the other a young maiden, lived by the courage of their biblical convictions. The world hated them for it, as Jesus declared that it would. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Remember the world that I said, said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. They persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep yours. And that's from John 15. Fastened to two long wooden stakes, the rising tidal channels of the river Blodock, with their enemies and loved ones looking on, the two Margaret's refused to recant. The younger Margaret quoted from Romans 8, as the water swelled around them, she proclaimed, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? No, in all these things we are more conquerors through him who loved us. They held fast to God's promises until their final breaths, passing from the deadly waters of the Blalock to the living waters of eternal glory in the presence of God and angels, for these two 17th century saints, death was preferable to compromise. Church history is full of inspiring examples of Christians who refused to compromise in order to avoid persecution and hardship. That is why we must study church history. The same is true of God's words. For instance, think of Daniel and his three friends. They lived in Babylon under wicked rulers with false religion yet they were unwilling to conform to the seductive lies of the world. By God's grace and with the Spirit's abiding strength, they lived with biblical conviction and rejected cultural acclimation. For, Donald, for Daniel, this meant worshiping God as he always had when it was made illegal to do so. Upon the pain of death by ravenous lions, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it meant courageously refusing to bow down to the blasphemous golden image of Nebuchadnezzar's gala, even though defying the royal edict meant being burned alive in a fiery furnace. The Bible is full of embodied examples of those who held fast to the promises of God in the face of cultural lies, pressures, and persecution. Men and women of whom the world is not worthy and who rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. We must return to these examples often for through them we are encouraged to stand fast ourselves in this present cultural moment. We must stand against the wicked trends of ideologies of our churches, our culture, and stand in true grace of God. Upon honest evaluation of our lives, however, it's clear that we don't always exercise the blood earnest conviction of the two Margarets and the godly courage of Daniel and his three friends. We want to, but we don't. And they didn't always live this way either affected by cultural hostility, fiery persecution, and a desire for worldly acceptance. We sometimes allow the fear to cultivate our heart to compromise. It can even become a pattern if left unchecked. But we must not despair. Giving up is not an option. Rather, we must remember the gospel, that Christ died on the 
cursed cross to pay the debt for all sinful compromises. Jesus paid it all by exercising faith in Jesus. We not only receive forgiveness and imputed righteousness, but we also receive the spirit wrought power that in, animates godly conviction and worldly opposition. Therefore, dear believer, as you seek to stand fast without compromise, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Compromise is less likely when our precious nail scarred savior is in view this kind of spoke to me thinking about today's culture and how we have to see so many things going against what we believe and how pressures of current culture have affected the faith that a lot of folks have um, I look around the world also we've talked about this in the men's group the reason this kind of came up as we've just got through studying the book of Hebrews in, in the men's group. And I got to thinking this morning when Alan had let me know that for sure he was not going to be here, what we could talk about. And faith was the thing that came to my mind. There's things in the news where if you're in Afghanistan and you're a Christian, you have to be fearful that somebody will just barely look at your phone and see a Bible app on it. There are folks in North Korea that have to meet in secret to avow their faith. There are folks in China that are persecuted by their faith in Christ. Sometimes it's easy for us to have our faith because we live in a country where it's always been encouraged to appoint at this point of time. Hopefully that will never go away. That's why I decided we would take a look at faith today. And to, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, and it's hymn number 179. Let's all stand together as we sing it. Jesus. 
thank you, Matthew, for helping today. I appreciate, couldn't have done it without you. And Nancy also. Hear the, today's benediction. But grow in the grace of knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.